Welcome back to this episode of the Law of Relevancy podcast. Today, I'm really pumped to have Derek Lala Birdie from Disruptor. Disruptor is a brand engagement agency, which is something you probably don't know or have heard of before. It is really quite an interesting thing what Derek has put together. And Derek, I really appreciate you joining us. We could learn more about what it is that you do and how to really stand out. I'm excited to be here. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's been a, a great partnership that we've had over the past few months, and it's definitely exciting to, to get this time together with you. So thanks again. Derek, one of the things that I, I really appreciate about what you're doing is you have got one of the most interesting LinkedIn feeds of anybody on that entire social media platform. And well, I'm flattered. Thanks. <laughs> you're welcome. But I, I got to tell you, as someone who does a lot of LinkedIn management for our clients, what you're doing is incredibly difficult to keep it as fresh and as interesting and as engagement. How do you accomplish that? Do you remember, uh, you're going to get a lot of this through the podcast, these like sidebars where I'm going to go to a separate point and I'm going to try to bring it back in. The show Martin, remember the show Martin, Martin Lawrence, hopefully you do, or somebody in that room does, but Martin had this joke where if something was really great, he would sort of walk around and be like, I need to let it marinate. I got to let it marinate. And I think, I believe, I shouldn't say I think, I believe that when it comes to social media or branding or even marketing in general, we don't let it marinate. We, we post if it's personal to check a box right? Because we feel like we have to, or we feel like we need to catch up. So as a, as a, an organization or a company, we put as much out there as possible and we really hope that it works. Or maybe we buy into this, uh, level of engagement where we need to have likes and we need to have shares and comments when, that's, to me, just focusing on the wrong thing. So when I say let it marinate, like if I have an idea or something comes to mind, I don't want to force it. I, I think about it, and I think about it, and I think about it. But when I do, I, I focus more on, on the quality than the quantity, and I don't pay attention to things like the time of day, um, or what's trendy or what isn't trendy. I, I think if you're genuine and you're authentic and you have a good idea, don't force it, but don't not share it, right? Like we put so much time and effort on talking about what our vested interests are when there's so much other space to be explored when we talk about what we're passionate about. And this is a this facilitation of self-discovery for me is, is years and years and years in the making of doing things that I felt were just different, not because I wanted to, but or felt like I needed to because I wanted to. I think you hit on a couple things I've noticed about your social media feed is that when you do follow your feed, when you scroll up and down the disruptor feed, it does come across very soulful. You are asking a lot of questions. And and I, I know I appreciate some of the things that you talk about because it does make me want to go, man, that's that's a bit pensive. I think I would like to, you know, explore that a little bit more in terms of what he's saying is consequential, right? And this that's what this podcast is about. It's about being relevant. It's about learning. It's about learning from others and sharing. And, uh, and it is, it's when you look at your feed, it does come across as very authentic. It doesn't come across as cheesy or self-promotional. And, uh, and it is really interesting to see how you actually navigate between one side or the other. And you seem to be in a very sort of happy zone with that, that perception and at least of how I perceive it. What is your origin story? Like, how did you end up down this path? Just for the record, the origin story Jordan ones are the Jordans I want the most. If anybody's listening to this podcast and wants to get me a pair of Jordans, uh, those are the ones that I want. What is my origin story? I'm a very distracted person, by the way, if you can't tell. Um, 
I started in sales in 2004 because I wanted to get married. I graduated from college. I wanted to marry my wife, my fiance. And I feel like in order for me to ask uh, my father-in-law for permission to marry Amy, I had to have a stable job. And the one thing I knew how to do was communicate well. Sales seemed like the perfect fit for me. And my origin story is I fell in love with this idea uh, from the sales advice where it was like, you know, uh, treat, uh, you know, take care of your customers and they'll take care of you. And that sort of transitioned into this. Uh, I actually got fired and then I got fired again. And then I went to work in corporate America for six years and I kept doing things different and different because the monotony of doing things the same all of the time got me the exact same results. And if I wanted to be this superstar salesperson in this corporation, I knew that I was going to have to do things I, I had never done. It was about getting uncomfortable, like get, get uncomfortable, do these things, do these things. And then finally one day I was like, I don't want to wear a tie every day the rest of my life. I don't want to shave ever again. Um, because I had to do both of those things working in corporate America and stumbled upon the software firm. And the, the really, this is where the sort of personal side of things and professional side of things sort of merge, whether, you know, it's what's happening to me in my personal life. And then at the same time, my professional life is salespeople are constantly doing things that somebody told us is what we need to do to get a hold of somebody. So I'm making thousands of cold calls. And at the end of the week, I look at my results and I'm saying to myself, I talked to 10 people, five of them hung up on me, three people pretended to listen to me, two people sort of acted like they wanted to give me a meeting, and one person did. And then I flew down to Nashville to meet with a guy who had no interest whatsoever in what it is I was talking about. And it would ebb and flow. So it would be like one week would really work, and the next week it really wouldn't work. And I'm sitting there, like, there's this debate on um, whether or not these cold this cold outreach actually works or doesn't work. And I'm like, this is the wrong question. Why are we asking whether it works or doesn't work? It's irrelevant. What you should be asking is, is this a waste of time? Is it the best use of, of time? And, and the answer every, to every time I asked that question was no, it's not. And I started in this sort of left the software company. I went to work for this uh, sales training franchise that I bought into and I had to do all the marketing. So I got all the sales experience and I'm doing marketing. And I don't know what marketing is other than I need to put my stuff in front of the people that want to buy it. I need to do more of that. So what am I going to do? Well, I like, started writing this sales blog. Well, at first people were really interested in the sales blog for like 10 seconds. And then they weren't interested in the sales blog. So I started this like, well, let me put a personal story into the sales blog. And this is a long answer, by the way. And then that sort of worked for another 10 seconds. But people didn't, they didn't want to pay attention to that. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write all about me. I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to talk about the crap that we deal with outside of the work hours that influence everything that happens inside of them. And I did that. And I wrote this article about um, really based off or inspired by this book that Andy Stanley wrote. It's called Choosing to Cheat. And essentially the concept is if you're going to cheat on something, don't cheat on your wife or your family. Cheat on your job. And I wrote this article. I told this story about how uh, I'm going to skip out on work and I'm going to go watch The Empire Strikes Back with my young kids because we're getting ready to watch the new Star Wars that comes out and I'm bonding with them. So whatever I got today is just not important. And it was like this sort of day in the life of how I came to this point in this article. And it got like 25,000 views on LinkedIn. And it was not what I expected. It was completely different. And then fast forward, right? This is where the sort of the origin sort of changes a little bit. I go back to work at the software company because I'm like, I'm not going to do marketing for the sales training franchise. I don't want to do that at all. I want to do marketing. I love this idea. And I go back into marketing. I take all the certifications. I'm, I'm doing all these uh, workflows and email campaigns and helping with the marketing team, helping with the sales team. And I come to this realization, and that is 
crappy content, forgive me, crappy content doesn't convert. It could be the greatest content from the terms of like SEO and backlinks, but if it, the content is not good, it's not going to convert. And I think you probably know that. So I'm thinking of like this blog that I was doing and writing and like, I, I need to do more of this. So I write this sort of playbook for our sales team. And then I'm asked to lead a team on how to do all of this. And we start with two people, eventually goes to seven. And we start booking like 25 to 30 appointments a month. Just being authentic. If you think about like, oh, how do I say this? So, sort of like in a sense of like influencer marketing. Like you want to you wanna share everything there is to share about your company. But on LinkedIn, you're tied to your company. When they go to your page, they're going to see who you work for. So you're sort of wearing the logo on your sleeve like an influencer would, but the idea here is to make yourself, for lack of a better phrase, famous. Like, put yourself out there all the time, and they will see who you work for, and this will be this, like, I want more of what this person has. I want to be attached to this person because they're relative. And by the time I left, I had this entire playbook of what I think we need to do to engage and, and, and interact with potential clients. And it really was around the, the idea of being authentic and being relative and talking about the things that we both share in common, which are we don't go to work every day so we can make our boss rich. We go to work every day so we can experience life with our kids. And that's what we all have in common to some extent. Right. And it worked. And here we are. I started the rupture. It was like, I just took you through like the, the history of, of my life in five minutes. Uh, in, you know, we're talking about 20 years. So you asked though, that was a big question. No, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to hear because I wanted to know how we ended up in this, in this place where you had something that was different. And, and I think, I think what's, you know, of course I've got a couple of questions about what you just said. Yeah. Like, for example, when you talk about being authentic, are you taking into consideration what you think people want to know about you, or are you just talking about what's on your mind? Both. Both. Um, I don't think it's necessarily that people want to know this about me. They want to feel okay about what they're going through. Uh -huh. And if you sort of lead the way, <laughs> then they feel like, oh, it's okay for me to talk about some of these things. Because some of the, like, Let's talk vulnerability for a second. I think people see like my level of vulnerability and they are frightened because they don't want to have that level of vulnerability, which I understand. But me being so far off on the vulnerability scale allows them to at least be somewhat vulnerable. And gotcha. people, people sort of, they misinterpret what it means. So vulnerability to me might be something very, very personal or some sort of struggle I went through, but vulnerability to you might be you're late for work today because you 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 had to drive three kids to three separate schools. You ran out of gas. You got a flat tire. You're just being honest with somebody about what's going on. That's a level of vulnerability that we don't often provide. We don't provide the messy stuff that happens behind the scenes. But those things that happen behind the scenes, we all understand and have empathy for. Yeah, it's almost like you're focused on the relatability because we're we can relate to that. Oh, 100%. I mean, you talk about like the value a salesperson or, or a marketing person offers a specific client. It's not what it used to be. What it used to be is I have a brochure. I have this proprietary information you can't get anywhere else. But you and I both know now I can do the things that, you know, your company does. And you can do the things that my company does. By finding out how to do them on YouTube, it's not a matter of whether or not you can do them or not. It's a matter of, do I have the time? I don't have the time. So what's the value that we add? It's trust. Yes. Do I trust you? <clears throat> do I trust you? And to, to, the fastest way to trust is vulnerability. It's a combination of, are you credible, right? you got to be credible. So if you go to Disruptor's site, or you go to my social, Disruptor Social, 
hopefully you find a level of credibility there that you feel confident to, to, enough to to discover whether or not you can trust me with with a project or something that you have. Right, and and just to key off of your name, disruptor. It's unusual that people put themselves out there like that because I I suppose it makes a lot of times people think that it makes them look weak. I guess maybe we're not for everybody, but uh, I think I think making yourself exposing yourself to those things that you may consider weaknesses are actually going to make you stronger. Right. He's a eight mile movie as a as a good reference here. So if you remember the rap battle at the end, Eminem goes last, where he makes it to the final. He goes first. Sorry, and he says everything about himself that he knows the other guy will use against him. And now the guy doesn't have anything else to say. Right. And I think you talk about your weaknesses. If all your weaknesses are out there, what what could somebody possibly say about you to knock you down? It's already out there. You can't get any worse. It can only get better. No, that makes perfect sense. Because then you're actually building trust because you're being honest with yourself and you're putting it out there and you're saying, hey, um, me as this individual, here's the things I struggle with. Oh, and oh, by the way, you may not admit it, but you probably struggle with some of those same things too. But at the end of the day, I'm working through all of those things. I'm dealing with the adversity that comes my way, and I'm successful. So come along, and I'll show you how you know to get through and muddle through, and, and we'll all be successful together. I mean that. We've all learned from experience, like, man, if I would have just told the truth from the start, I wouldn't be in the situation I'm in. Yeah. I you know, agree. just lead with, with, with some sort of honesty. If I can't do something for you, I mean, I'm going to tell you I can't do it for you. That, give me an example. I have a client now. They're an incredible <laughs> client. Phenomenal client. Um, I, you know, like, you know, I, I was in the software business, custom software business, for a long time. And they're a custom software provider. They're an incredible custom software provider. And they do offshore development. They're in India. And I, I absolutely have fallen in love with this company and what they stand for because they really have a culture that defines what culture is. And culture is what you say about your company when you're not on the clock. And that's, this company exemplifies what we hope for in a culture. And they've come to me and they said, we want you to teach our developers the communication strategy with our United States clients. And we want you to talk about empathy and we want you to do a six month sort of training course. And I'm like, look, I talk about this stuff at church. I talk about this stuff with friends and, and life groups that I'm in, but I've never done this on a professional sort of pay me, pay me type of level. And I was honest with them. And it was humbling for them to say, we know. <laughs> Ooh, that's why we think you'd be great at it. And it was one of the most incredible professional experiences I've had to, to, to walk through this uh, sort of with them, knowing where I'm coming from. Like, I'm putting this together. I'm customizing this for you. Uh, but I've never done this before. And it was, it was awesome. It was, a, it was a, another facilitation of self-discovery for me that I, I can't put a price tag on. It was awesome. Yeah, I, I can. Yeah, I mean, in my own personal experience, the times when clients know that they're innovating with you, know that you're doing something you've never done before, but still trust you to be the one that they want to do it with. I can't think of a more sincere compliment or, you know, show of respect for your your professionalism or whatever. I mean, that that to me is the greatest compliment that you could possibly receive. That's that's really cool. Yeah, it, it is, and I, I actually would love to hear more of how you've experienced that because you know I'm, I'm only I'm only two years in, and technically a year in doing this full time as my full time gig, and that's the sort of thing that I I want to learn. I want to hear from people, so yeah, I definitely want to talk to you more about that at some point in time because these types of things continually happen through the throughout this process of building this business. Every day is different. Well, I think, every, I think, every day. yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you a thousand percent, Derek. I mean, I think one of the things that clients really respect is when you can tell them 
something's not possible or you're honest with them that maybe it's never been tried before or, hey, I don't know what the result is going to be, but here's the things I'm going to be looking out for. I'm going to be paying attention to this, this, and this. And if we notice this one is getting out of control, we're going to do this. And having, being able to communicate some of that, like where we're going, think about it almost like somebody's leading you on an expedition, right? You're the person they've picked to help lead them down this uncharted territory or uncharted path. And when you can be honest with them and tell them the truth about, we don't know what we're going to encounter, but we're going to be paying attention to these things and be honest with them. And sometimes even tell them, no, like, like, Hey, we can try that if you really, really want to, but I highly, highly recommend it. I would not do it myself. And, uh, you know, and then you can come back to it because you can still do your best or whatever, but you can always retreat back to that place of, it's not, I told you so, but it's almost like, um, Hey, we learned from this. Even if we fail, we're going to learn and we're going to be better for it. And eventually we're going to win and we're going to be much, way better than the competition. Um, I was talking to, uh, you know, talking about some of your approach. I've experienced some of it this, even this week, I'm working with a, uh, a software company and they have an affiliate program <clears throat> and I'm trans I'm transparent with my clients about this, uh, this affiliate relationship. It is the gold standard. A lot of times at my company, I'll, I will partner with whatever the gold standard, whatever the best possible software or best possible provider of a service is, and they can go Google it and research or whatever, and they can see it's the best. But I, and I will go and establish an agency relationship with them where I might make a commission off of selling it. I'll never be sorry for recommending the best there is, ever. I would be yeah. sorry if I recommend something that is not as good as the best and it doesn't work out, but I don't ever have to apologize for recommending the best. And I was talking to him and it was this bank. They have 275,000 customers and they were looking at this CRM system potentially to help them facilitate one-to-one -one communications with their clients. And uh, the director of marketing was talking to him and she goes, Cord, you know, I really appreciate the insights and everything I said, but my rep at the software company keeps pushing me to the pricing page. Anytime I have a question about the implementation or how it's going to go or whatever, they just keep trying to sell me on it. I just need more guidance. I need more assurance that we're making a wise decision. And she was telling me that because she appreciated that I was doing that for her and that I was explaining there's all these different ways that we could go we can go fast we can go slow we can go with this part yeah. being the lead with this part being the lead and she felt really assured because we were being honest with her and at the end of the day we may or may not make the commission or make the sale but it doesn't matter because at the end of the day she's going to trust us and if she doesn't do that business with us she'll do some other business with us a year from now right yeah I, it's you know, I think it comes down to just being reliable, doing what you said you're going to do. Uh, that that goes a long way. It, that's that's one thing I've learned. You know, I I had a a client ask me to sit on their uh, their their meetings for redesigning their site, and I said, "Look, I I think I can provide some pretty valuable user experience, or." Uh, you know, UX sort of points as we go through, because I've been through this before, but I don't necessarily see a, an engagement here. But because you're such a great partner, um, I will offer my time for nothing, one hour a week, indefinitely. And um, <clears throat> towards the end of that, they had actually offered their services back to me, one, for nothing, help me build out some campaigns for nothing, and then in turn, actually just gave me an entire year's uh, worth of work to do. And I don't know if that's because of that, but it's this level of, you know, never selling them something they don't need. Right. Or charging them for something that I don't need to charge for it. I mean, it's, it's a partnership. I think you need to treat clients that way. I would go as far to say as like, if you're actually selling someone something, so if you're taking somebody to the pricing page and constantly selling something, people are going to stop listening because people don't want to be sold. That's right. 
And I think now more than ever, if you're in a situation where, like, like your client, where you recognize you're being sold, you're probably not going to buy. You're probably going to tell everybody why they shouldn't. Like, this was not a great experience. I mean, more than ever, people want to buy, they don't want to be sold. I mean, it's, it's like the Instagram impact. Uh, I say that because you buy everything on Instagram because they know exactly how to market to you, or somebody does, because it's the thing you're actually interested in buying. I think that's, 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 that's the modern buyer, if you want to talk about the modern buyer, which I don't really think exists. I think it's just the way it is now. So, Well, I think, I think you're hitting on something. If we're buying, I don't know, Irish Spring or shampoo or something that's not very consequential, Instagram and Facebook and social media, those are very good places to market to me for those things because what's my risk of buying the wrong shampoo? 20 bucks? Right, maybe an itchy scalp or well, something. Maybe. Right. <laughs> it's like, I mean, good, good, good. if your hair falls out, then it, you know, that's a little bit more. Yeah, that is consequential. That's true. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, could, I, could, I could, you know, yeah. but it, but if if it's something that represents a significant amount of money, a significant amount of your time, <clears throat> you're going to look for trusted partnerships, and I really like the way that you're able to do that at scale, and I like the way that you're able to share some of that playbook, so to speak, with sales teams. Because at the end of the day, they are sales teams. They are trying to meet goals. What are some keys? Or what are some, or do you have like a, uh, a checklist or some things to think about, some swing notes that help people who are in the business of selling to, uh, to sort of keep focused on so that way when they are trying to do the sales thing and to meet a quota or to move product or whatever, what are some ways that they can go from the traditional approach to cross over into more of a Derek approach, disruptor approach? Sure. Uh, perfect. So <clears throat> we talked about this beforehand. So I believe that sales is the new marketing department and marketing is the old sales department. Now let's keep that in a vacuum quickly. So let me answer that or talk about that quickly. Salespeople need to change the way that they prospect for clients. So the traditional approach, and I always joke, I joke with a few friends, like, whatever your dad taught you, stop doing that. And what I mean is, it's a nice way of saying, don't pay attention to the, the previous generation's way of doing it. And that's not a knock against them. But if somebody tells you that you have to get a hold of this person or else, like, you have to. What's the one way that you know you'll be able to get a hold of them? And we don't, we know the answer, but we, we don't internalize it. And it's not pick up the phone and cold call them. We think it might be, but it's not. It's not cold email them. It's not write them a letter. It's not follow them on social. It's show up at their door, right? At 7.30 in the morning, because you know they walk into the business at 7.45 and casually bump into them on the street. Never do we think of that. And I think you can take that, extrapolate that, and we talk about like, okay, I want to engage with somebody genuinely. I think you can break it down into a few different approaches. But sales needs to do different sales, selling behaviors and then bring those results back to marketing. And marketing then can create sort of this one-to-one -one specific content for the person that you're engaging with. It goes from a 3 to 7% conversion rate to like a 75% conversion rate, if you're following me. And what I mean is, sales starts a ton of conversations, socially, with people about whatever. But they're engaging in conversation and they're, they're communicating. And it's a relationship. And then once people show any type of interest, you sort of take yourself out and you you say, hey, here's here's something I had my marketing team or something we put together for you that maybe will be helpful. And it's very, very catered towards that person. And you see you see marketing agencies doing this now. Like once we had somebody um, <coughs> selling us a, a marketing automation tool several years ago, and they personalized this approach, and I thought it was just beautiful. 
Like it was, they knew every single thing about me, not, not because they stalked me on social, but because they paid attention to triggers and cues that my company was putting out. They used sales enablement technology to, to understand what we were using, like, what our site was built on, what automation tools we're using, and they catered this specific marketing content towards me, and it converted for them. I responded to it. And I think that's so much more impactful than the traditional, you know, one to a million marketing, organic marketing, right, where we put up this content and we hope that people fall through this funnel. You're going to keep doing that, but there's a different way to do it. So the sales side of that is to actively pursue someone or passively pursue someone. So we're talking disruptor cadences here. So if I wanted to specifically get a hold of you, Cords, I'm going to follow Bake More Pies on social. I'm going to follow them on uh, or follow you personally on social. And when I say social, I'm talking about anything you have a public profile on, probably going to. I'm going to socially surround you, and then what I want to do is start to engage with your content, right? This, this uh, genuinely comment on something that you may put out or something that your company may put out. I might, I might actually share the content and tag you in it before I ever send a direct message. And then before I ever pick up the phone or send some sort of email, I might send you a handwritten note and a gift thanking you. Maybe I'll write you a recommendation on LinkedIn or write your company a great Google review. I might actually try out your company. I might point something out to you that I read on Glassdoor. I might use some sort of trigger or cue that your company actually put out. There's so many different ways that I can actively pursue having a conversation with you rather than booking a meeting with you that's genuine, that works versus, hey, Cords, it's Derek with Disruptor. I catch you at a bad time. Right. This one's totally different. I, at the first approach that you mentioned, if you were trying to sell me software or something that was expensive, I would, I would almost feel like I owed it to you by the time we actually started talking about work. Yeah, you would. And this is the shortcut, right? So salespeople are always looking for a shortcut. So if I talk to somebody about branding themselves and aligning that with you know, their company's message, I'll be like, look, I want you to make 15 comments on potential customers' content. <clears throat> and it's like, or it's, hey, thanks for sharing, thanks for sharing, thanks for sharing, I love this, thanks for sharing. It doesn't work because it's not genuine, but the more you put into it, the more you can expect to get out of it. So if I go into content that your company shares or... Uh, that you share, and I leave the most thoughtful comment on that thread, and I talk about how awesome it was, how valuable it was to me, what I think other people would get out of it, and maybe I ask you a question. You're going to feel almost obligated to respond to that comment. Yeah, you've just, you just implanted yourself in my, in my brain. You're living inside my head at that point. All right, so let's talk, let's break this down a little bit further. So here you are, you're somebody who's paying attention to what you're saying, Derek, and I'm selling something to let's just make up an industry like the oil industry, okay? Like, it could be anything. It could be like a drill head or something, right? And I'm brand new, I'm fresh out of college, I'm hungry. What are some tools, like do you do empathy mapping? Do you literally, do you learn everything you can about the industry or about their problems? Like, what are some tools tools that we can use to get uh, to get f to the answers quicker, to be relevant faster um, with, with some of these people that we want to have these conversations with? <clears throat> Let me share with you a tactic that um, I actually talk about in, in my course, which um, is now on my website, which is a shameless plug for that. But That's I don't okay. want to take credit for I don't want to take credit for this because I think you know, all of us had a great teacher, some sort of inspiration along the way. And I'm sure he knows this, but I I went to um, an inbound conference that HubSpot put on in 2016. And I I went there <laughs> to see Gary V's keynote. I did. And then I walked away going to two separate seminars, both of which are the foundation for what I do that I had no idea I would ever do. And one of them was 
Social Selling Mastery, which was a book written by Jamie Shanks. And Jamie actually gave uh, what I think is one of the most incredible seminars I've ever been to because it was your best customers are your current customers. Your best new customers are your current customers. It's just like, what, what do you mean? So if I'm trying to sell in the oil industry, whoever it is I sell to, we don't use LinkedIn for prospecting correctly at all, at all. And what Jamie taught me was this, this, this idea called advocate search. So I'm going to create a list of every single customer that I have just using LinkedIn. It doesn't even need to be Navigator. You can do this in standard LinkedIn. And I'm going to select the titles of the people that I normally work with at these customers. And I'm going to check one box, and that box is past company. They used to work for my current clients. Now, I can reach out to these people. I can do exactly what I just mentioned about this active sort of cadence uh, to them. And then when I finally get an opportunity to talk to them, I can bring up, if they haven't already brought up, the fact that I've done work at a company they used to work for. And now I have this immediate sort of bond with them. So if I'm B2B sales, B2B this works really well for, that's the first thing I'm going to do. It turns any cold outreach into a warm outreach. Um, and I, I mean, I would, there's, there's so many tactics here, but it's, a, it's literally the first thing that I'm going to do. Well, I, I, you and I have had a conversation before about the attitude that you have when you are actually selling something. And I always think about it because I know that I'm going to engage somebody with something that I can help them with, right? So I'm only going to engage with them if I truly believe that I can help them. And I'm going to be accountable to that, right? And so some of these tactics you're talking about they, they're, you know, they seem very advanced on, you know, just hearing f from you about them. It's, it's like an extra step. It's like, it's a deeper level of effort than many people would normally take. Like it's the whole, the old way to do it. The way your dad did it is to do the dials, right? Look them up, do the dials, get as many volume. It's in the numbers, blah, 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 blah. What people don't realize is there's, they start to tune their their freak their the volume of what they're doing the the uh, they're making themselves irrelevant to the people that they're reaching out to because they haven't put in the work they haven't done what they're trying to do and I'm thinking about some of the stuff you're sharing with us and if a lot of times you'll hear salespeople say golly if I believe in it I can sell it you know if I believe in it if you are that salesperson who is selling something that you truly believe in. I would think that using some of your tactics makes their work a hell of a lot of fun because they're getting to help a lot of people. Hey, I mean, if you truly want to help someone, that's your end goal, right? I mean, we all know the lagging metric here is to close deals. But if you really want to help someone, you're not going to be forcing them to sign a contract. Correct. You're not going to be talking to them about what's in it for you you want to be asking questions and engaging them about things that you think they may need. And using your experience and what you know about what you believe in will definitely further your game. But you cannot sell. And I know this is anti-sales, right? But I think the new sales move is not to use a move. Right. Like, hold on. Hold on to your product knowledge. Hold on to your offer as long as you can. <clears throat> Like, have you ever talked to somebody about anything and they ask such incredible questions and they act because they are so genuinely interested in what you do? Like, take this podcast, for example. Like, we want your podcast. We want everybody to hear your podcast because it's, it's great. It's great for you. But imagine if you took the approach that you take in a podcast where you put all the, the onus on the person that you're talking to or the, um, appreciation on the person you're talking to, if you just did that in life, how much further along you'd be by taking that kind of interest in what people are doing? Guys all know how to do it. 
Okay. They don't know they know how to do it, but they know how to do it because most of us that are married had to do this at least one point in our life. <laughs> That's right. Like, I cannot, I can't screw this up. Like this is the one I can't screw it up. And I think you take that approach to your clients. You probably have more clients. Yeah, no doubt about it. You touched on something that I heard called an, an internal referral. One of the most powerful things that I've seen in business is where I'm doing work for some corner of the business and maybe it's a large organization and somebody at that business actually refers me to somebody on the other side of the business and said, hey, I'm getting results over here. You should try this person. Is that something that you teach people how to do as well? I haven't really got into like referrals. Um, that's not because I don't think they work. Just going back to the honest thing, it just it's never really been my my specialty. I, I think I, I have some a, a few wounds to lick here. Uh, this is like me sitting in with a financial advisor who slides a piece of paper across the table and says, "Can you write down the first name of the?" the first three people that come to mind when it comes to financial financials. And you're like, we, I haven't even used you yet. Like I just signed a deal. Now I want to resend the contract I just signed and fire you. So I, here's my thing. Um, I think when you earn the right to ask, you should ask. There's a lot of, you know, it comes to referrals. As soon as that, as soon as you know the experience is good, where, where, wherever you are within that experience, if it's the moment they sign the deal, um, the salespeople say that's when you got to ask. Ask for the referral. Ask for the referral. I would probably wait maybe until after you've actually delivered something to say, hey, you know, rather than giving me a referral, could you maybe share socially? the experience that you had, or could we take a photo together and maybe you post it and tag me in it? Like, let me help you help me or help me help you. Something like that. It's mutual. <clears throat> I think that may be a version of the new referral. Uh, but then for me, there's the, if they really like you, uh, I really feel like you did a good job. They're likely going to want to tell everybody. Right. Uh, at least tell somebody. So that's what I'm talking about. Actually, it's it's the manifesting okay. a referral, not a uh, having a promotion. You know, fifty percent off when you tell your friends or any of those types yeah. of things. It's sort of like how, how do you actually manifest referrals? I mean, we've built our entire business on referrals. We we're the advertising company that doesn't advertise for ourselves. Nice. Okay. Well, I I think you know without really thinking much about. <clears throat> The actual question until just now, maybe that was enough. Maybe that's sort of the experience that I have with it. It's just when you earn the right to talk about it rather than saying, you know, will you give me a referral? Like, let's do something together to collaborate, right? Right. Let's collaborate. <clears throat> yeah, why not? Because you yeah. know that... Uh, that other half of the equation, the other group you're working with is going to work their ass off to be successful, to make you look good. Um, it's a low risk proposition. There's more, you know, potential. Yeah. You know, I, I just got a really great referral, um, from a client. We've been working together for maybe six weeks. We're actually, we're only eight weeks in now. Uh, I traveled out to San Francisco to meet with a company, did a, a, a pretty extensive workshop with their entire team. And I came back and I got a call about this company that needs a lot of these things um, that I can help with, the majority of them. And it was like, hey, we think you're the expert here. We want to bring you in. We want this to be yours. And I mean, we've already talked about this. I'm going to bring your company in to do some of these things. And I've been very specific or very uh, transparent with the client that, hey, this is this is how I'm going to do this if, if I can deliver. If you're okay with the way I deliver this, and they were absolutely okay with it. 
That's fantastic. Well, I so, yeah. appreciate it. That's huge, man. We, we, we're going to make you uh, proud and happy you did that. Um, let me ask you a question. So we're kind of nearing the end of the conversation here, but one of the things that you have done recently is like you were talking about your courses, right? So obviously, ideally, you would have a one-to-one authentic relationship with everybody, but sometimes that's not possible, whether... You know, uh, maybe they don't have the budget for your time individually, but you still have something to offer them. Tell yeah. us about your courses. Tell us about how we access them and where we can find them. Sure. Well, let me tell you the origin of the course <clears throat> quickly. Um, if I, where this comes from, if I'm looking, let's say, how, so I have a, a Traeger grill that I bought thanks to the pandemic, pandemic, excuse me. I didn't mean for it to come out like that. Like, <laughs> it's okay. It's like a <laughs> R- Rich, Richard, you got an edit button on that thing. Um, this that's from Tommy Boy. The, so I bought a Traeger during uh, basically my spring break was canceled. Uh, so I bought a Traeger. So I would smoke all this food, which I fell in love with doing the past couple of years. But the Traeger doesn't heat the pellets anymore. Like my smoker doesn't work. It's a big time problem because you know Thanksgiving's on Thursday and I'm responsible for the bird. And this is where this comes from. This is how I do everything. And it's like, okay, I need to learn how to fix it, and I got to fix it fast. So I want bare bones. How do I do this on YouTube? So I can watch a three-hour video on how to do it on YouTube, or I can watch a five-minute video on how to do it on YouTube. Probably going to go with the five-minute video on how to do it on YouTube. So when I think of my course, like how to how to implement what you already have, which is your personal brand, like. You have one. You, you're marketing something. Maybe you don't realize what you're marketing. How do you marry that with your professional brand? How do you implement uh, sort of a, a cadence for uh, engaging people that potentially are interested in talking to you, right? Like something as simple as that. And then what are some of the tools that you can use to not get these shortcuts, but sort of enhance that engagement? So. I think of when I created this course, I don't want an eight hour course with 40 sessions and exam. I want the a c- consolidated approach where you can get everything you need for a, a minimal amount of money uh, and have something that you can walk away from knowing exactly what to do, how to do it, and you can do it right away. Because that was not my experience. So when I created the course, I wanted it to be exactly that. You're gonna come in, two hours, two and a half hours. You're going to get all the documentation, everything that you would need. You can do it over, you know, in your own pace. I mean, it's not going to take you two and a half hours. It'll take you longer than that. But the information that you're going to need, you're going to get in two hours. Done. And you can find that easily on my website, disruptor.com. And you spell disruptor, D-I-S-R-U-P-T-U-R. That's right. The misspelling of the word was $5. The correct spelling of the word with a few other words because Disruptor wasn't available was way more. So I went with the misspelling of the word, which aligns with all the grammatical errors I've had over the years. That's right, man. Well, Derek, we really appreciate your time. We've learned a lot from you, and I'm looking forward to collaborating with you on many things into the future. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. uh, Awesome little setup you got here. You got it, man. And so uh, tell us where we can follow you. LinkedIn is is definitely my jam. Uh, so I have this, uh, you know, I think you know, like we've talked about several times. I've been doing LinkedIn since longer than I've been doing Facebook, and I'm not really a fan of Facebook. But if you want the the uh, you know the, the PG thirteen version of of Derek of, of Disruptor, that's going to be on LinkedIn. If you want the I won't call it R-rated version, but you want the personal side of me. I have a pretty extensive TikTok following, which goes against the grain of a lot of people. Um, but I'm very, very authentic on my TikTok. Um, and it's growing uh, pretty significantly. You can do that as well. But um, I can send you the uh, the link tree that I have if people want to access me that way. Yeah, well, absolutely. We'll share it when we publish the podcast. And you can follow this podcast anywhere where podcasts are found across all the Bakemore Pod social media. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us.